Between Two Fires. Part Two. Now the great plague had stilled the hearths in the countryside and darkened the windows of the cities of man. Death's hand sat upon the brow of the king and also the farmer. Death took the beggar and the cardinal, the money changer and the milkmaid. The babe died on the breast and sailors brought their ships to port with dead hands. And the wickedness of man was laid bare, so great was his fear of this pestilence, for the mother fled her children, and the son nailed shut his father's door, and the priest betrayed his flock. Still other men said, God is gone from us, or never was at all. Let us do as we will, and take pleasure as we may, for all is lost. And so the wicked went in bands, and took the daughter's maidenhead and killed others for their sport, and some shut themselves away in walled towns and let none pass. When the bread was gone, they drew lots, and some were given to the butcher that the rest might live. Some righteous men and women yet held faith, but they were scattered so far that none could see the other's light, and it seemed the darkness had no end. And the Lord made no answer. Now devils walked the earth, at first in dreams, and then in flesh, and hell had dominion in diverse kingdoms. Those men who died in furtherance of evil yet walked as shades, and even those who died in goodness might be raised by devils and abused. Sacred places were turned rotten, and holy men abased, so the seed of Adam could take no comfort, and the prayers of men and women would not strengthen the angels of the Lord, who were grown frail, and the Lord made no answer. Now the greater devils who walked the earth were Raum and Oye and Belphegor and Beelzebuth, whose agents were flies. Two-thirds of the fallen had gone even to the walls of heaven, where a great war raged, a war of bent light and thrown stars and noises that killed, a war of great limbs locking and the spear and the sword. It was a war of tooth on wing, a war of machines whose effect were abomination, a war of shaken walls, a war of hammers that, though turned, broke the arm that held the shield, for the strength of the angels of God was reflected strength, and the source was grown distant. Yet the fallen had sat long in the coals of their exile and grown hard, and their strength was their own. And their generals were Lucifer and Asmodeus and Astaroth and Moloch, and the angels who resisted at the gates were Michael and Zephon and Uriel and Raphael, for Gabriel had gone to look for the Lord. But the Lord made no answer. Some few angels of God slipped from heaven by stealth and hid themselves, whether in the fields or in the cities, and worked against the fallen angels as best they could, and to save the lives of men, though they did these things in secret, for their powers were grown weak upon the earth. Certain treasures from heaven they hid in the earth as well, in case the walls were breached, and among these were pots of oil, and scents from heaven's gardens, and nectar, and gold from the tails of stars. And also they preserved certain tokens from the time God walked among men, and among these were his sandals, and his crown of thorns, and the nails from his wrists and ankles, and also the spear that pierced his side. It was the hour of the fallen angel, and God had stopped the fountain of his love, and it was said that he had gone to make a new world, and new angels, and new men, and the walls of heaven would fall, and all these now struggling above and below would perish. Chapter 10 of the City of Paris 
Paris first announced herself with a column of smoke rising over a hill. They knew they were close, as they had been following the river from the west, and Tomas... Excuse me, this is chapter 9. <clears throat> I'll start again. Chapter 9 of the City of Paris. Paris first announced herself with a column of smoke rising over a hill. They knew they were close, as they had been following the river from the west, and Tomas and the priest wondered if the whole city might be burning. When they crested the hill... Tomas felt ashamed of his naivete. The city dwarfed the fire, which was outside the walls. In any case, a, big fi a fire big enough to burn that city would have rivaled the furnaces of hell, and the smoke from it would have blackened the bottoms of the clouds. All that was burning was a wheat field, and the fire was at its end, burning itself out against the banks of the Seine. Several houses had been reduced to blackened skeletons, as had two cows. One calf lowed from a hillock, barely visible from behind the curtain of white smoke that surrounded it. The fire would spare this beast. The octet of ragged figures around it, however, would not. Already they were testing the smoking earth to see if it would burn them through the rags and bad shoes on their feet. Already they were hefting their axes and daggers. They didn't look like farmers. Tomas scanned the fields and saw a pair of legs jutting from a patch of unburned wheat. Murder, then. Tomas was suddenly sure these men had set the fire. He should have waited and watched longer before they approached, but it was too late now. Several of the killers looked at the cart as it passed, but nothing in the cart could possibly interest them as much as the calf. One of them looked at Tomas, and he met the man's gaze, not in threat, but to let him know he would fight if he had to. The man quickly assessed that they could take the cart, but not without cost. He looked back up the hillock. Now Tomas lowered his eyes in shame to remember that, had things fallen out differently, he might be standing in that group with Godfroy and Jaco waiting to carve the dead man's calf. I saw it. What? Your soul. Tomas remembered the last winter with Godfroy, when his were the most feared brigands in high Normandy. In the better months, they had restricted themselves to robbing merchants, particularly on the roads leading south and east toward the Champagne fairs, trundling away carts laden with food and wool on the way down, and gold and spices on the way up. December came, however, with rain and sleet in its fists, and breath that numbed them to their feet. Food ran scarce, and their reputation now worked against them. What merchants traveled then did so under arms. Villages set watches for them and hid their grain in caves and under clever hidden doors and pits in the fields. Their very few coins and other small goods went down wells or in coffers buried under straw. They hid themselves, too, because they knew that Godfroy, whom they called the Black Cat, would stop at nothing, even torture, to learn where they hid their meager treasures and their livestock, which, to Godfroy's mind, included daughters. In response, Godfroy learned stealth. Near Gisors, just before the Christmas feasts began, the brigands stopped outside a village they would all remember though they never knew its name. Two men stayed with the horses. The rest waited until almost sundown and walked two miles through the woods to the most isolated farmhouse. Everyone inside was likely to be asleep. Peasants slept long hours in the winter to save strength. The thieves muddied their faces and crawled on their bellies until they were close enough for Jaco to shoot the guard dog. The windows were hung with sheepskins to keep the heat of the fire in, and the cold thieves coveted the warmth nearly as much as the food they hoped to find. Tomas grabbed the sheepskin and yanked it down, rolling awkwardly through the window with his sword drawn. A calf lay in the middle of the dirt floor, with a goat and two children sleeping against it. They woke up at the sound of Tomas's heavy feet and stared at him. They thought a devil from hell had come to them, and they weren't far wrong. 
The others leapt in as well. One of the children cried out, and the rest of the house woke up, all in one room, six adults on a moss-stuffed bed. An old man at the end reached for something on the floor, but a nearly toothless little killer named Pepin leapt the calf and the children in two steps and stabbed the man's belly. He dropped whatever it was he'd grabbed for and palmed his wound, huffing, Oh! Oh! The only other men, probably an in-law and a hired man, froze and offered no fight. They were soon shamed by an old woman who swung at Tomas with a fire poker. He ducked it and shoved her down where another man sat on her. She yelled and this man punched her until she stopped. Godfroy noticed that one of those on the bed was a decent-looking girl of perhaps fourteen, probably already married. He yanked her off the bed by the foot while Pepin hovered over the rest of them with his knife. They took the girl and the beasts out. Tomas carried the goat over his neck, and Jaco led the calf, but the real prize was a milk cow on the other side of the house. They butchered her that night in the hills, along with the other animals, smoked the meat, and rode off before the local lord could muster sufficient men to deal with them. Just before they left, they let the girl stumble back into town, mostly intact on the outside. Tomas had argued with Godfroy about the girl, but in the end had walked away. The meat had gotten them through January. The family, of course, would have been reduced to begging from their neighbors, perhaps even forced to sell their land. As the brigands left the house that night, the old woman had gotten up and yelled after them from the doorway. Her words were slurred from her newly broken teeth. God will see you in hell. You're the devils now. May you choke and die and go to him sooner. Normally, some of them would have jeered back at her, but her words fell on them with the weight of a proper curse. Robbing peasants felt much more sinful than robbing, pe uh, than robbing merchants, but Winter didn't care about such sensibilities. In February, they robbed another farmhouse, and this time the men fought. Pepin was killed, as were the men. Godfroy ordered the house burned. A dark-haired little boy, just in pants, stood bewildered near the blaze, saying as if there had been some mistake, We live here. We live here. Not six months later, the plague had come, killing most of the thieves and everyone else. Nothing matters any more. Tomas shook away his ghosts and turned his eyes now to Paris. Her walls were the faintly yellowed white of bones, and her turret stood proudly, each a lazy bowshot from its neighbor. He could see what must have been the Louvre, the king's fortress, strong and white, cut from the same stone as the city walls. The spires of cathedrals poked at the sky, and the roofs of the shops and houses tumbled against one another. Even dead, if she was dead, Paris made a lovely corpse and yet Tomas wished she had burned. He would have embraced any excuse to keep going as they had been, on small roads or no roads, meeting few living souls, foraging as best they could. How long could they live like that until winter? But what then? I don't care, Tomas said at the end of his chain of thoughts, and neither of his cartmates pressed him for what he meant. There was a great deal in this world not to care about. The Porte du Louvre was the closest gate, and luckily one of the few that remained open, the, the provost of Paris, on the authority of the king, who had long since fled, had shut most of the other gates in a vain attempt to close out the scourge that was killing the city. Rare carts bearing food were allowed in. Anyone at all was allowed out. Strangers could enter so long as they appeared healthy. The guards on the top of the wall did not appear healthy. They were underslept, ashen, and cranky, though not energetic enough to cause much mischief. They told the girl to display her armpits, neck, and groin to them, but did not care to make Tomas strip down his armor, and likewise told the priest to keep his robe on. The priest shook his head at them. One of them apathetically tossed a small stone at the priest. They waved the card through. 
Now would be a good time to tell us what you're looking for, Tomas said to the girl. The girl nodded. She looked frightened. She didn't look like she knew anything about why they were here. The first thing is to find lodgings, the priest said. Nobody alive wanted them, and the dead didn't answer. They wound through the narrow, muddy streets at turns disgusted by the filth beneath their feet and awed by the soaring spires of churches or the houses of the very rich. On some streets, the houses and shops were so close they nearly touched heads together over the muddy paths, throwing everything into shadow. Some bodies, at least, were being picked up in tumbrels pushed mostly by desperate-looking fellows who had as much to fear from hunger as from the murderous stale air around the dead. Nobody answered at the inns on the right bank, or when they did, it was just to tell them to go away. Most of the people who had gold had already piled their possessions in whatever they could still find with wheels on it and headed for the countryside. The only medical advice that proved sound against this sickness was run far and stay long. Yet even that worked only if you were lucky or well-informed enough to run when it hadn't struck yet. And if you were not already sick, the only thing that slowed its spread was the speed with which it killed. Once it was in you, you had a day, or maybe two, before you were too sick to travel. Or hours. Thus it spread from town to town at the speed of a leisurely walk. But it missed nothing. So they went south on Saint-Denis until they got to the bridges that crossed the Seine onto Ile de la Cité, the island at the heart of the city. The larger of these bridges, the Pont aux Changeurs, was for wheeled vehicles and beasts and had shops along the sides, none of which were occupied. Likewise, nobody was bothering to collect tolls. Between the shops on their right, they could make out the smaller bridge, the Pont aux Meuniers, which was only for pedestrians, and had thirteen water mills at its base. Both bridges were wooden. The celebrated stone bridge, the Grand Pont, had collapsed during a winter flood fifty years before. At that, at that time, that had seemed the greatest calamity Paris could suffer. Now the mills at the base of the pedestrian bridge regularly spat out corpses that citizens living close to the river had jettisoned rather than waiting for the cart to come. On the island, they rode past the strong white walls of the royal palace, atop which several archers were laughing, firing their bows at something on Rue saint barthélemy As they cleared a stack of empty, ruined wine barrels just near saint barthélemy church, they saw the target, a very fat dead man with thirty or forty arrows stuck in him and more stuck in the mud or lying with their points broken off from hitting the stone building behind him. They would have to cross the field of fire. Please don't shoot us, brothers, the priest called to them. We don't shoot priests, said one of them. Well, he doesn't, said the other. Hey, father, make a circle with your arms, a big circle, the others laughed. They were drunk. Yes, and put that bastard driving the cart in the middle of it. Shut up, he looks like a knight. Knights ride horses. A glass of cider says he's a knight. All the more reason to fling a shaft at him. Maybe he's one of the eunuchs that let the English shame us at Crecy. Don't let Sir Jean hear you. Fuck him, he went with the king. You may pass, but hurry. Yes, hurry. Tomas urged the mule forward. For a long moment, the only sound was the clop of the mule's hooves on the muddy street. You wouldn't, one of the archers said. I dare you, said another. Tomas said, don't look at them. An arrow whistled behind their heads and stuck in the dead man's open mouth. Philippe, you did it! I work better with obstacles. Past the palace and St. Barthélemy Church, they went right on Rue de la Vieille d'Apri, and then right on La Juiverie, named for Jews now absent, having been expelled from the city yet again, nearly thirty years before. Soon, 
seeing the twin square towers of Notre Dame off to his left, Tomas tilted his head back and spat toward the great cathedral, watching the white spittle arc and separate in the air. He imagined it was a stone tossed by a trebuchet and that it would knock a hole in the gorgeous round window over the doors, but it just fell in the mud. They were coming to the southern part of Ile de la Cité, where the Hôtel Dieu stood near the Petit Pont that led to the Latin Quarter. The Hôtel Dieu would have, been, would have let any poor traveller stay one night, as was its custom, had the great hospital not been overwhelmed with those dying of plague. A staggering heap of bodies lay outside awaiting removal, two of them filles blanches, young nuns in white who had been taking care of the sick. A glimpse through an open window revealed a hell of vomiting, coughing, and sobbing, with a very few wretched figures in white trying to ease the torments of far too many. The girl sobbed and the priest held her. Tomas's hand jerked with a long suppressed reflex to cross himself, but he did not do that. He ground his teeth and shook his head. As they approached the bridge to the left bank, the girl sat up from where the priest had been holding her and looked at the grey waters of the Seine rushing under it. A dead sheep floated by but didn't keep going on the other side. The priest wondered if it had caught on debris down by the piers and if that debris included people and surprised himself by not feeling anything about it. On the other side, at the entrance to the Latin Quarter, they passed a painted wooden statue of Christ upon a pedestal of stone, at the foot of which a feverish woman grinned, sweating, with a dead cat cradled in her arms. Tomas looked up at the long-headed Christ and said, not wholly under his breath, You're dead too, aren't you? If not, get off that whoring thing and do something. Or at least whoring wink at me. You can do that much, can't you? It didn't wink, but the woman did. They wheeled along in the butcher's quarter, where the mud stank with the blood and viscera of slaughtered animals, a few of which were still being butchered, despite the paralysis that gripped so much of the city. A man grinned a nearly toothless grin at them as he cut the throat of a suckling pig he had just tied up by its feet, its blood jetting on his stiff leather apron and into the pail he had placed beneath it. He called out the price of the pig, but they couldn't hear it over its squeals. The men of Rue de la Boucherie seemed to be doing better than the dyers on Gobelin, just nearby, where nothing was moving at all. They got lost again in the labyrinthine streets and began to despair of finding lodgings. The sun was so low that only infrequently did it finger its way between the buildings to throw cool golden light on the mud. Just such a shaft of light illuminated the foot of a masculine-looking woman. She sat in the doorway to a leaning timber building with flaking paint. A shy-looking young man stood near her, cleaning his nails with a rusty knife. You look lost, she said to them. The priest looked first at her greasy blue stockings, then up at her tangled hair, and finally at her face. She had the look of a wary mastiff. She also had a mustache that might have better suited a thirteen-year-old boy. We are, he said. Tomas noted that she was a big woman with strong hands and shoulders, old enough that the man near her might have been her son, and that she wore a fine hat, a rich man's floppy felt hat with a gold pin. Doubtless there were more fine hats than living heads to fill them in this city, and after a point it could hardly be considered looting to liberate them. The girl noticed her eyes. They seemed kind to her, despite the woman's rough look. Out of nowhere, she wanted the woman to hold her. It had been so long since she had smelled a woman's skin that even a dirty woman's embrace would have been welcome. She was still disturbed by the sight of the dead young nuns near the hospital, and she wanted a woman to hold her and tell her that the whole world didn't yet belong to death, masculine death, with his hourglass and his holes for eyes, death with his bony arms that only embraced to take you away, like a lamb from market, like the pig on la boucherie. How did heaven come into all of this? Heaven was life, not 
death. Heaven was a woman holding your head in the crook of her arm and looking down at you. Heaven was a warm hand on your cheek and the smell of soup with garlic on the fire. How could people enjoy anything in heaven with their noses rotted off and their ears full of mud and worms and no cheeks and no hands to lay on cheeks? She had never felt so alone or so confused. Maybe I can help. What are you looking for? She thought she smelled garlic coming from the building. A bed, the priest said. A, a stable, anything. You're in luck, the woman said. I own a few buildings in this neighborhood. The renters all died in one just down the street. You see it there by the big puddle with the blue door. But it's dry and it's got two decent beds. How much have you got? How much do you want? Ho, ho, said the woman. You're stumbling around this dead city an hour before dark with your heads up your asses. Lucky anyone says a word to you. And you want things done your way. Are you going to tell me how much you've got? Well, no, but I will tell you what, you're, what we're willing to spend. The last of the sun slipped off her belt and now winked on a silver spoon hanging from her belt. Ten deniers. Ha! That's a country priest for you, she said to the young man, whose nails... Oh, excuse me, I, I fucked up, I have to go back. And you want things done your way. Are you going to tell me how much you've got? Well, no, but I will tell you how much we're willing to spend. I'm sure it's not enough, but tell me, I could use a laugh. The last of the sun slipped off her foot and now winked on a silver spoon hanging from her belt. Ten deniers. Ha! That's a country priest for you, she said to the young man, whose nails didn't really look any cleaner for all his knifing under them. First time in the big city, eh? All right, all right. How much? Three sous. Is this room perhaps in the royal palace? Tomas said. She narrowed her gaze and jerked a thumb at him, looking still at the priest. I don't like him. The priest said, He's a bit gruff at first, but he has a good heart. How about one sou, five deniers? I'm not the one who has to bargain. It's three sous. How do we even know you oh how do you even how do we even know you own the room? Tomas said. If he talks again, I've got nothing else to say. The priest looked imploringly at Tomas, who shrugged and turned his gaze away. Will you show us the room? said the priest. I'm not getting up. I don't step and fetch for you. What about this young gentleman, Père Mathieu said, indicating the sly young man. He's busy. May we have the key? When I get the money. May we at least see the key? You may see it and have it when I get the money. The priest went to the cart and got the coins, which he reluctantly put in her large hand, she made them disappear, then rummaged in a moldy pouch on her belt and produced a small brass key. Holding it up before the priest, he looked at, he took it and frowned at it. It looks like a coffer key, not a proper door key. Oh, she said, am I a liar now as well as your servant? Then give it back to me and go your ways. Go and sleep in shit for all I care. I am a priest, you know. Then pray for a room. Never mind. We'll take it. But it had better be what you said. Fine. The woman now produced a little piece of ginger and began to chew it. The girl salivated despite herself and asked, Do you have any more ginger? The woman shook her head and flicked her hand at them. They left. Maybe sixty yards away, they stopped the cart near a big depression in the road in which a puddle had formed. The priest approached the blue door the woman had indicated and went to fit the key, which was clearly too small, into the lock. But the door opened anyway. The room was mad with flies. Three badly decomposed bodies lay in the room, which stank miserably from them, but also from mold the roof had fallen in, urine and feces. Several piles of turds lay near the open window. Clearly, people sat over the ledge to shit, 
or pissed freely through the opening, the dirt floor was also littered with animal bones, eggshells, fish scales, and all other manner of refuse. They had been sold the right to sleep in the neighborhood morgue, latrine, and dump. The priest gagged, the girl moaned, and Tomas went to the cart and got his sword. Drawing it from its sheath, he ran the sixty yards back to the stoop, but of course the woman and her companion were not there. He kicked in the door and went into the building where a young woman grabbed up a child he had knocked over with the door. The child screamed and held his head. An older woman he didn't recognize stood frozen near the fire where she had been stirring garlicky pottage, and now a man grabbed up a meat cleaver. He stood in front of the women and the child, but was too scared of Tomas to move forward. What do you want? Get out! he pleaded, gesturing impotently with the cleaver. The... the old woman on the stoop! She cheated me! What woman? She sold us a bad key! What? You hurt my son! I don't know about a damned key! You're hiding her! Tomas said, but didn't believe himself. The old trickster had nothing to do with these people. The money was gone. A thin-limbed man with a strangely protruding belly came from upstairs with a sword, but he froze too. Rob them. Make them give you what they have. Tomas shook that wicked voice out of his head. The man from the stairs licked out toward Tomas with his sword, but he was scared and kept himself well out of range to hit or be hit back. Get out, said the man with the cleaver, his face very pale now. Get out, said the mother, still holding the hurt child. The woman at the pot threw a ladleful of hot, oily pottage at him. Tomas could see in the young father's eyes that he was working himself up to take a real swing at him with the cleaver, and there would be blood if that happened, a lot of blood. I'm sorry, he said, backing out of the door. An old man looked at him from a window across the narrow street once he was outside, but then moved into the shadows, saying feebly, Go away. Leave them alone. Confusion, anger, and guilt wrestled in him. Whore! he screamed. You rotten whore! Shut your hole! a deep voice said from a high window. You're a thief! You should know about thieves around here, Tomas rejoined. He spat on the ground and stomped back to the cart. Nobody followed him. Tomas returned to the cart just as the priest was about to throw the useless key into the street, but the girl said, May I have it? Whatever for? It's pretty. Her simplicity made Père Mathieu embarrassed for his anger at having been cheated. He gave it to her, and she smiled up at him. If it made you smile, it's not completely worthless, he said, smiling back at her. I'm glad you two are so goddamned happy, Tomas said. You have food on you, said the girl. Never mind that. Now what? I suppose we sleep in the cart, said the priest. All right, let's pull it away from this shithole of a neighborhood first. A few minutes later, on another street, the girl pulled a green ribbon from her sack and tied the key around her neck, then sat back looking at the last orange light of the sun on the rooftops, that was when she saw the angel. It was neither male nor female, but both somehow and more beautiful than either gender. It asked her to sing a song for it. I don't know if I feel like singing, she said. It asked her to sing anyway. The light was on its beautiful hair, and the whole street suddenly smelled like pine trees and juniper. She sang, Hey, little robin, hey ho, do you sing for me, hey ho, in your Easter best with your pretty red chest, do you sing for me, hey ho, hey, little robin, sing hey, do you fly to your nest, sing hey, to your house of sticks and your pretty little chicks, do you fly to your nest, sing hey. Hey, down there, said a man from a second floor window, I know that song. Are you from Normandy? The girl nodded. So I am. My mother sang us that on our way to church. I haven't heard it in... Oh, pardon me. Are you from Normandy? The girl nodded. So am I. 
My mother sang us that on our way to church. I haven't heard it in twelve years or more. My mother sang it to me as well. Are you healthy? The girl nodded and showed him her neck. All three of you? On the blood of our Savior, said the priest. You shouldn't be in the street now. It's nearly dark. Tomas stopped the cart. Do you know what happens after dark? The man continued. We have no place to go, the girl said. The man looked back over his shoulder and exchanged a few words with someone. Then he looked at them again. I'll feed you, the three of you, if you'll sing it for me again. Jean de Rouen was a woodcarver. He sold wooden statues of Christ and the saints, but especially Mary, from his first-floor shop, and he and his wife lived above this. His success meant that they did not share their house with another family, as most merchants were obliged to. The workshop was neatly kept, except for the odd piles of shavings, and the priest felt bad about bringing the mule inside. Jeanne insisted. While his guests sat down to table between the kitchen and the workshops, Jeanne fetched a bottle of pale spirits, setting out a bowl and pouring some in. He gave it first to the girl. Do you recognize that? She made a face but nodded. Papa likes that. Everybody's papa likes that in Normandy. It's made from the best apples in France. He shared the bowl around. It made a pleasant little fire in their bellies. The priest set in praising the artisan's figures. Tomas, who recognized their long-headed style, said, Did you make the Christ on this side of the bridge? The woodcarver flushed with pride, hoisting up his very heavy brown eyebrows, which hardly thinned over his nose. I did. A marvelous, a marvelous figure, said the priest. A welcome reminder of Christ's love after the misery at the Hôtel Dieu. Actually, the Abbey commissioned it, hoping it would keep the plague out, but we've had plague. And worse. Worse? The priest asked, not incredulously, but hoping for specifics. <clears throat> You'll sleep in my workshop. Keep the windows closed and barred. If you use the slop jar, don't open the windows to throw it out until morning. They don't come every night, but it's been nearly a week. They're due. What are due? If you hear something heavy treading in the street, pray hard but quietly and stay away from the windows. And if anything knocks, don't open. What knocks? Jehan darted his eyes at the girl then shook his head and took a deep breath. What comes? We don't know. Nobody who sees them lives. Jehan's wife, Annette, brought out stale bread trenchers with the last of their thin soup. Don't be shy about finishing it. We've had ours, she said. Overcome with emotion at her kindness and her plain, handsome face, the girl kissed her hand. The wife stroked her hair. The girl suddenly felt the hurt in the woman, how it mirrored her own. One had lost a daughter, the other a mother. Each saw a flicker of the dead one. It was bitter, but very sweet and good. Annette took her head into her bosom, tentatively at first, but then with great emotion and cried and into her hair. What are you called, little bird? Delphine. They cried together and held each other as the priest looked at Tomas, and Tomas looked down, deeply ashamed. In their weeks together, neither man had ever asked her her name. The liquor was soon gone, and the embers of the fire were cooling. After a hushed consultation with his wife, the woodcarver took his hat in his hands and asked Tomas and the priest if the girl might be allowed to sleep in the bed with Annette. Jehan would make his bed on the woodshop floor with the other men. They nodded. Thank you, Delphine said, and went upstairs. The priest and Tomas looked at each other, each thinking the same thing. She's home now. This is her home. 
When the men were all settled on the tightly packed dirt floor, Jahan spoke to them in a whisper. It's not that nobody has seen those that knock. It's that what they've seen is so awful. Go on, Tomas said. Maud, a widowed hatmaker on the next street, heard them knock and didn't open. But she heard her neighbor, Hubert, open for them and then yell. Her house is old, and she could see out through a space between the beam and plaster. She said a stone man had Umbert by the hair and bit his nose off. Then it went in, and a stone woman after it. The whole family was killed, bludgeoned and bitten. The work of the devil. It was dark, yes, the priest said. Of course it was. They only come at night. How could she be sure it was stone? Maybe these were just thieves. There was stone dust and bits of stone in the house from where Umbert's son tried to fight them, and I reckon you could tell a stone man from a man of flesh even in the dark, and what thieves bite people to death. Hungry ones, Tomas said, but neither of the other men found that funny. His sorry joke hung in the thick darkness of the workshop for a long moment until the mule took a relaxed and abundant shit on the woodcarver's floor. Tomas started chuckling. <laughs> and soon the priest and Jahan were chuckling as well, and then the three of them were trying unsuccessfully to bite back laughter like naughty boys in church. What's so funny down there? Annette called. Oh, nothing, <laughs> Jahan said. One of our guests said he enjoyed his supper. They laughed themselves to sleep. Nothing knocked for them that night. Morning came. The sky was a bright gray that neither threatened rain nor allowed for the possibility of sunshine, but it was welcome after the night the men had spent huddled on the workshop floor listening for the knocking of God knew what. Tomas was up first, and he opened the window enough so that he could try to scrub the worst of the rust off his armor. The sound woke the priest, but the woodcarvers snored on, the scent of his Norman apple brandy still spicing his exhalations. The priest sat close to Tomas and spoke quietly into his ear. What are you going to do if the girl stays? She'll stay all right. She's already spreading rushes with a woman and helping her kill fleas on the coverlet. So what will you do? Same as before. Push on. Where? Hadn't thought about it yet. I have. I think I still want to get to Avignon. Your catamite brother? The priest winced at that, but nodded. There was something flinty about Tomas this morning. You might come with me. In your cart? How else? I might take the cart and leave you here. I couldn't stop you, of course. I know. Don't talk like that. What's gotten into you? I'll talk as it pleases me to talk, and don't look so wounded about the cart. Just because you went out to the orchard and found it doesn't make it yours. I'm not contesting that. I just thought, well, don't think. I do better alone. That's all. I don't know how I found myself tagging behind that little witch in the first place, or with you. I'm damned already, as are you, though you don't realize it because you've got your robe and your cross and your Latin. I just... Don't want anybody's eyes on me if I have to do things to survive. I see. No, you don't see. What you don't see is that you're a common bugger priest, and she's just a skinny little girl who wants her mother. And I'm an outlaw knight who's been formally cut off from the sacraments of the church. Death means hell. So I'm going to keep death off me as long as I can. And I'll do that better in the country than I will in Paris or Avignon. The woodcarver stirred, but then went back to snoring. Your, your excommunicate? Tomas nodded. Then stood up from the floor without the use of his hands, as a fit young squire might have, as if his anger made him youthful, with his brow creased and his eyes set belligerently. He looked thirty, not forty. He looked like figures of Mars or Lucifer. He 
got his sword and sharpening stone and squatted nimbly back on his heels. When, the priest said, does it matter? I'm just curious. It's, it's so final. I thought I'd let you know before you cried too hard about parting company with me. Why did they do that to you? What do you want, the given reasons or the real one? Uh, given first. Heresy, sodomy, blasphemy, the usual things to turn a petty lord's village against him. You don't strike me as a sodomite. Oh, but heresy and blasphemy sit well, do they? Well, perhaps blasphemy, you do have a colorful way of expressing displeasure, but why did they really excommunicate you? To get to my land, why else? Blasphemy is serious. This from the man who took communion from a monkey's head? That really happened? If we both remember it, I'd say yes. The priest's face reddened with shame, and then he looked forlorn. Don't take on so, said Tomas. Nothing counting matters. That's the way a man talks before he damns himself. It's not the first time I've said it. Tell me what happened to you. Is our host sleeping soundly? As if to answer the question himself, Jahan the woodcarver exhaled hoarsely with his lips, making a sound like <sighs> The priest looked back at Tomas. Tell me. Chapter 10 Of the Battle of Crecy It had rained. Just a quick August shower, and then it was gone, and everything smelled like late summer with just that hint of damp and rot. The farms in Picardy were stubbled where the wheat and barley had already been mowed. The ground was moist and Tomas could smell the good black soil of his home province, even over the equally pleasant nose of horses and oiled steel. His lord, the Comte de Givras, had sued for the pleasure of being in the first line of knights to charge the English, where they set themselves on the field at Crecy, which meant he sued for Tomas's right to be there too. They drew up in the first line of attack, along with Alençon, the king's brother, and came up to the edge of the field, looking at their adversaries. The invaders under King Edward of England had backed themselves up a terraced slope between two copses of trees with a flat field before them. At least, it looked flat on the approach. A bank with a drop the height of a man revealed itself as the French host drew up, to attack the English lines, the Knights of France would have to ride around to where it flattened out, which was only about 80 yards from another run of trees, and then mount the hill. It was a funnel. It was a trap. The crossbowmen, mostly little Genoese mercenaries whom the French called salamis, went out first at the king's command. They were bitching because the big shields they hid behind while reloading hadn't come forward yet, and their hempen strings were wet from the rain. Besides, it was late in the day, and they would have to shoot uphill and into the sun. They wanted to wait for their pavis. They wanted to wait until morning when the sun would confound English arrows. King Philip told them they would have worse than arrows to deal with if they didn't do their work tonight. But as the French were all about to find out, the king didn't have anything worse than arrows. The salamis came running back after about ten minutes, more than a few of them bloodied and stuck with feathers. Tomas would always remember how one had an arrow stuck straight through his hand and was waving it about as if it were on fire and he might put it out. A French knight yelled, They've switched sides! And another yelled, Cowards! And soon the impatient knights were riding over the Genoese through that narrow pass to get at the English. Some even struck down at their fleeing allies, but Tomas's lord did not, so neither did Tomas. They rode hard at the line of English knights, 
who were standing at the top of their tawny slope like bait. They were standing with their pole axes and swords, confident the French would not reach them in any shape to hurt them. They were flying the banner of the dragon, as the French were flying the sacred red oriflamme, which the Valois king had fetched with great ceremony from Saint-Denis. Both banners meant the same thing. No quarter. Tomas's seigneur wanted at the English king, whose camp sat by a large windmill, or at his son, the Prince of Wales. He wanted to punish them for the insult of their small numbers. The French had them three to one, as men-at-arms went. Most knights, lords of manors and castles, large and small, from the breadth of France, had only contempt for the rows of farmer soldiers arranged in wedge formations between the English knights, but Tomas's blood wasn't so far above theirs, and he had a bad feeling. The archers were standing like dogs at the crouch, with their longbows strung, and little fences of arrows stuck into the ground at their feet. They were waiting. Tomas guessed that they had picked a landmark to range their first flight, and that they would loose when the French vanguard passed it. Now the hill got steep and took the speed out of their charge, the horses sweating and blowing hard from their nostrils. Tomas looked at a knobby shrub jutting out and thought, that's it, even as Alençon's horse drew beside it. The English archers, rough plowmen from Lancashire to Kent, with over-muscled right shoulders and no feeling in the first three fingers, sank into their hips and pulled their heavy bowstrings, bowstrings back to their ears, as did the pale, dark-haired Welsh bowmen in their party-colored green and white, some five thousand archers in all. They loosed. Tomas couldn't hear the slap of all those bows through his padded avantai and helm, but he saw the arrows rise like a swarm of flies and then come down. He had no visor. Many of those who had them didn't push them down in time. The arrows fell hard with a noise like hail on tiles, but also sick and wet where one slammed through chain mail or into horse flesh. Men gasped and swore and screamed, but the horses' screams were worse. They bucked and reared and bit at the arrows sticking in them. Some turned their haunches and ran, while others lay down and refused to move again. Many fell and pitched their riders. The French line was dissolving, and they weren't halfway to their enemy. Tomas saw that his lord was riding crooked in the saddle, and then saw he two shafts sticking out of the older man, both in the chest. The older man would have fallen, but for the deep saddle and high pommel, made expressly to keep knights cinched in place. Tomas raised his lance and couched the butt in its futur, reaching out to grab the reins of the comte's horse, and then an arrow went whang on the lord's conical helm, and he felt a sharp slap on his face, like from his mother's spoon in the kitchen. Suddenly he was leaning back, almost out of the saddle, looking up at the clouds. But his eyes weren't focused right, because there was something white in the sky. Fletching. He had an arrow in the face. He sat up, and the pain hit him so hard he dropped his lance and almost passed out, but he didn't. The horses had both stopped. His seigneur was slumped to one side, in danger of falling. Tomas tried to speak, but only blood came out of his mouth. The point was in his tongue. What was left of the French line, maybe four dozen knights and the Comte d'Annonçon, was bullying toward the English, their backs receding as they rode to die. As the remnants of the French vanguard closed, the English began to touch off crude cannons, sending brass and stone balls whizzing into men, sending limbs and scraps of armor and fabric in all directions, sending gouts of smoke skyward the banging cracks like near thunder further terrified the injured horses. One night to Tomas's left, whose surcoat blazed with three crescent moons argent, tried to regain control of his mount, which was kicking madly with a half dozen shafts in him. 
The horse kicked Tomasa's leg and broke it even through the grieve. Then his eyes as wide as goose eggs threw his rider off and stamped the man's helmeted head into the mud again and again with his front hooves, destroying it utterly. Then he lay down and died on what remained of his master. He was not alone. One Englishman would later say the dead horses were lined up like piglets to suckle. Tomas grabbed again for his lord's reins, using the rowels on his spurs to guide his own horse and turned them both away. The Comte de Giveras groaned as if in disappointment and another shaft caught him in the back. Tomas spurred them both for the French lines. But the next wave of knights was charging at them, shouting Saint-Denis and glory. They were beautiful in their surcoats of many colors, a flock of exotic birds heading for bird lime. Some of them were dying already as the arrows were falling their way now. Only the fact that the archers preferred charging knights to retreating ones saved Tomas and his lord from being riddled. The volleys had also opened up big enough holes in the ranks for the two men to pass through, although one knight in robin's egg blue glanced against Tomas so hard he knocked him into his seigneur, who nearly fell again. He was shaking his head, ashamed not to be dying on the field, but he was certainly dying. His little page, Renou, and Tomas's squire, André, ran up with a barber surgeon who helped the injured men off their mounts. Tomas was nauseated from pain and all the blood he had swallowed, and the eye above the arrow wouldn't stop tearing. The surgeon used a pair of shears to cut the arrow on the comte's back so he could lie down to die. The comte de Givras was a more important man than Tomas, but the surgeon attended Tomas because he saw that he might live. He pulled the big man down, and wedged a stone between his back teeth to keep his mouth open, then cut the corner of his mouth, forcing the shears in to snip the shaft. He got the point out of the tongue. Nothing had ever hurt Tomas so badly. Then pulled the shaft up out of the tongue. His hands were slimy with blood, and his grip kept slipping. He would have stitched Tomas, but someone had him by the sleeve now, shouting, The king's musician is hurt! The king commands you! And he was gone. The page held the seigneur's hand as Tomas heard his awful breathing. He was drowning. He died, clenching his teeth and shivering. He was awake until the very end and knew what was happening to him, but he did not cry out. Tomas did, as much to see that the great man was dead as for his own pain. It was the worst day he had ever known. With the squire's help, Tomas sat up and watched the second wave fail too, though some had gotten close enough to exchange blows near the banner of the Prince of Wales. Soon they were finished and a lull followed. Now bare-legged Welshmen ran from the English lines and stuck knives into the eyes and visors of the stunned knights on the ground, killing them as easily as boys hunting crabs. Tomas's eye was hemming itself shut as the injured side of his face swelled. Men who passed them did not recognize him. Now a man wearing the king's livery came and took both Tomas's warhorse, who was lathered in sweat and stooping his head, and his mild-mannered palfrey, who always did a side-to-side -side dance when he smelt lettuce. He never saw either horse again. The sun went down, and still the beaten French rallied again and again to ride into the gloaming. Tomas had a moment's hope when he saw the windmill near the English king on fire, its great spars turning ablaze like a slow wheel in hell. But the English had burned the windmill themselves to give their archers light to murder by. It had been dark for an hour when the call went up to flee. There would be no more French charges. The English were coming down from their terraced hill, and there was nothing to stop them. Tomas was suddenly aware of being alone. He did not know where his squire was and could not remember the last time he had seen him. The cries of wounded men being killed on the ground grew closer, as did the rude, choppy language of the killers, confident now, calling out to one another. 
Tomas sat up as best he could with his sword pointed behind him, ready to take the leg off a Welshman before he died. He heard hooves and wondered if an English knight was about to spit him. He turned his head. There was his squire with a horse, a tired old nag from the baggage trains. Tomas tried to speak but wept when his swollen tongue touched his palate. Andre made a shushing gesture and with some effort got Tomas up and then on the nag's broad back. He leapt in front of his master and took Tomas's great weight on his back as he took the reins and they cantered away from Crecy on Pontier. The night was very dark. The nameless horse sometimes pitched to avoid the body of one who had tried to flee but succumbed to his wounds. So many had died that Tomas could not comprehend it. The plain below the English position would be known as the Valley of Clerks, for it would take an army of men with pens and field desks to record the names and titles of the French dead. It was at the town of Amiens where Tomas convalesced, his squire having paid a surgeon to see him. A good thing it was a bodkin point on that shaft, the surgeon had said, as he put first wine and then egg white in the punctured cheek. A broadhead would have never come out, as it is. I'm scared that tongue will sour and kill you, so I'm tempted to have it off. But then what would you pray with? Before he pulled the tooth whose roots were knocked loose by the arrow, then stitched the tongue and face, the surgeon told the squire to hold Tomas's head still. Tomas grunted something. That's what they all say, he said, but he'll hold you just the same, and if your lordship bites me, I'll yank a good tooth as well. It had taken less than an hour, but it was the longest hour Tomas could recall. The ten minutes he took to set the leg seemed merely purgatorial after the hell of little pliers fishing in his cheek for loose bone and the dip and bite of the curved needle in his tongue. You'll not be so pretty now, but you may live to thank the Virgin if she saves you. The pain's a good sign. I'll come around again tomorrow night. Splash some more wine on that around supper time, but no supper for you till Tuesday, and then only broth and raw eggs. God felt so bad about throwing man out of the garden, he gave us the chicken, which gave us the egg. Wouldn't surprise me to find out Angel's blood was eggs whites. God rest you, Sir Knight. The squire stayed with Tomas for two weeks while the arrow wound toyed with his life first reddening around the margins, then running clear, then slowly, very slowly, beginning to heal. When Tomas was out of danger, though still not well enough to travel, he sent his squire home to tell the lady of the manor he was alive. The seneschal, who had been watching for Sir Tomas, stopped André at the gate and told him what had happened. The squire turned around quickly and rode hard for Amiens. Andre stood in the little room, with his hat in his hands and his hood thrown back. He measured his words and spoke them slowly, pausing before the worst ones. Sire, your keep and the lands of Arpentel are forfeit to the Comte d'Evreux of Navarre and Normandy. Your seneschal made to stand against him and prepared for siege, but your wife... Fearing the Comte's cruelty, should he breach the walls, treated with Devreux, and let him into your keep. And it seems, after very little struggle, her bed. Your son, however, has been declared by the Comte, the lord of the manor, and stands to inherit when he comes to majority. Devreux, in the interval, is regent and protector, and your rents will go to him. Save enough for your lady to keep a modest household. Tomas shook his bandaged head and said words that sounded like the king. The king is weak now. The lords of Normandy scheme against him and treat with England. King Philip gave our fallen lord's lands of Givras to the Norman to keep him from rising in plain revolt. And now he has seized yours, which border Givras, because he can because you were faithful to your seigneur and he was faithful to the defeated king you have been moved aside 
Tomas shook his agonized head, his eyes tearing. Further, the squire said, You are declared excommunicate. The bishop of Laon himself has ordered it against the protest of your priest. They will strip you of your spurs in absentia, empty the chalice, and lay down the cross. If ever you return and try to claim your land back, the priest must deny the people the sacraments as well. Tomas made a sound that might have been, when? The ceremony is tomorrow. And so Tomas had healed. When his money ran out, he went west to Normandy and sold his soul to Godfroy, watching always for the heraldic crest of the man who had ruined him, Chrétien, Comte d'Evre, the gold on red wheel of Spain quartered with a barred field of fleur de lis. Tomas agreed to stay with the brigand so long as they stayed in high Normandy. Godfroy agreed that they would often visit the Comte's domain. Tomas swore that this grasping lord, with lands in Spain, Normandy, and Picardy, who had his piggish eyes even on the crowns of France, would die in the mud at a brigand's hands. He swore it, spat on a cross, and flung it down. Since God had permitted his excommunication, he would earn it. Tomas never thought himself the kind of man to take part in theft and killings and to permit rape, but in the name of revenge he had become exactly that kind of man for a time.